Scripture reading today is in Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wise tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly, for physically training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So be it. Good? Okay, we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we just come before your throne today, Lord, because of Jesus Christ, that we can approach you, Lord. Through your spirit, we can cry out, Abba, Father, with all of our concerns. Whether it's times that we need a special boost or times we need the words to say that we don't have or even the prayers that we can't pray, Lord, you do all things through us and you will complete in us the work that you have started. For it's by faith that we're saved through grace. And Lord, you are working out a masterpiece in your children. Together we are the church tied together. Lord, fill us today. Use us to be your hands and feet. Lord, I do thank you and praise you for being a part of this body and for the love and the service that I see that shines through, just screaming to the world that we love Jesus. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. So I entitled this, In Shape with Question Marks. Are you in shape? And the subtitle is Training for Godliness. Some of you noticed my little outfit because this is not accustomed to what I'm wearing. I feel kind of stupid. <laughs> Some of you noticed my shoes. You said, oh, you even got new shoes to go with it. No, these are my workout shoes. <laughs> They're not new. I've had them for a year. What does that tell you about my workout? Now, in my own, own defense... There's a little bit of stain on the bottom, and these shoes have not left inside because I use them on an elliptical. But I haven't used that elliptical in a while. It hasn't become a uh, hanger for clothes yet. <laughs> it's just during the summer with the kids and stuff, I felt like I was being active of enough. But that's probably not the case. We probably all should exercise more and everything, but we'll talk about that. Are you reading Luke, first of all, because you need to be reading. That's why I've got a reading plan out there, and you should have started Luke this week. And I want to start out with Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up or to set in forth in order an, an account of the things that have been fulfilled, believed with certainty, bringing to fulfillment to the end. That's what that word means. Being fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from... From the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated, and that means with a perfect understanding that, that Luke could write this and teach this, everything from the beginning, I decided to write an orderly account, not necessarily chronological as you're reading this, but Luke places the stories to emphasize the points that he's trying to make that he has encompassed from Scripture that the Holy Spirit's putting on his heart. <clears throat> I have... I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Whether that was a person or not, it means friend of God. So that you may know the certainty to be firm, to be safe, of the things that you have been taught or instructed. Not so that you will know them, but so that if you believe them, you will live a life like Christ. If you believe, you are called to be a light. You are called to be a witness. If anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And Luke even puts follow me daily as that emphasis. We know that already, but Luke puts that in there because he's writing that orderly account so that you understand the things that you've been taught with certainty, so that you understand that you're to live a life different from the world. 
You are holy, you are blessed, you are loved, and you are set apart and empowered by the Holy Spirit to be the light in the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. If you read the chapters, you read about the birth of John the Baptist foretold, the birth of Jesus foretold, Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth and sings a song of joy. John is born, Zachariah sings his song of joy, Jesus is born. The heavens sing their song of joy. If you missed that, you go back and read it. Jesus presented in the temp temple, Simeon sings a song of salvation and joy. Are you seeing this pattern where people can't be quiet? They have to say that salvation has come, that God loves mankind. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <clears throat> and then at uh, 12 years pass and Jesus is lost, <laughs> but then found, where is he at? He's in the temple courts in his father's house. Jesus grows, John the Baptist grows, John begins his ministry and he te teaches and begins his ministry with repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, change your way that you think so it changes your behavior. Because before you're going to say that if I obey the law, I can be righteous. But none are righteous, no, not one. The law just shows me how wretched and sinful I really am. So repent and change your way of thinking. See that salvation is a free gift from God that you can accept freely and be saved. And then if you have accepted that gift, use it. Because the Holy Spirit, He lives inside of you. He ties us all together, gives us spiritual gifts so that we can be the body of Christ. And I'm going to say again, I am proud to be part of this body. You guys served with the love of Jesus in your heart. You were a comfort, and I heard it over and over again, and especially from the family. That's why we're here, to let them know that we love them regardless they don't have to come to this church regularly or anything else. They're part of the family of God because of Mary Ann's light. And her light will continue to shine and shine and shine in this world because of the way that she lived her life. This is my story. That's Mary Ann's story. She lived it, the life that we live. Because people will remember the things you said. They'll remember some of the things you do. But then the actual events won't necessarily come up unless you see a picture or anything. But they will remember if you had the love of Jesus in your heart. They don't have to know the specific events. They'll know that it permeated the way that you thought and the way that you lived. That mindset that changed your heart because you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You didn't conform to this world any longer, but you, did, you t told the world that you weren't a part of it anymore. You belong to another kingdom, to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> And then immediately uh, Jesus gets baptized, and John also says that you need to show uh, fruit. You need to produce fruit that proves your repentance. And then Jesus is baptized, and he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. To face any and every temptation that you think you're going to face in your life. So again, that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, has faced those temptations, and he was the spotless, sinless sacrifice, as you read on, for your and my sins, that we could be reconciled to God, not just brought back into a right relationship with Him, but through the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said He would tell the Father to sin, we are His children. Now don't forget that, because children get the inheritance of the Father. And your inheritance, your deposit has already been put in the bank with the Holy Spirit. The more that you live that life, that Romans 8 life, the more you'll draw it onto that bank account and that power that comes from God to transform you into the image of Jesus. This life is not about you. It's not about the things. It's not even about the loved ones. It's about the love of God in you and living through you because you are a child of God. Don't forget that. In Luke 3.23, now Jesus himself was about 33 years old when he began his, his ministry. <clears throat> He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. That's a lineage there. Don't get lost in that. Let me explain it to you. I can't. <laughs> we think that since the genealogy is different in Matthew and Luke, that one is Mary's and one is Joseph's. But there's a lot of other things that could go and play if you study that, so don't get caught in that. But also study to, prove, to show that you're a good workman that can rightly handle the word of truth so that when people come in, that's a dividing point is why I'm trying to put it out there. Some people say those genealogies are different. There's discrepancies in the Bible. 
And if you go to try to find out exactly and prove it to yourself, you're going to come up with some, some answers, no exact answer. I'm going to stick with one's Joseph's genealogy because Luke says it was assumed, it was thought that Jesus was Joseph's son, so he traces it back that way. But either way, the lineage works. God's word is infallible. It is his unchangeable word. It is true. You don't have to understand everything. Don't try. Don't get caught on that. Don't quarrel over legalities and customs and everything else. Love and serve. Don't miss that point as you're reading. <clears throat> Jesus begins his public ministry at age 30. And the first thing recorded is that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and was led into the wilderness. Filled. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, let me tell you this. If you believed in Jesus Christ and He became your Savior, and you proclaim Him as Lord, you are completely filled. If you don't pull into that, if you don't tap into that, if you don't let the Spirit of God live through you, however you want to say it, then it's because you're not doing it. You're not allowing it to happen because you won't set yourself apart from the world. You're conforming because you're still serving another master. You won't deny your desires and your needs. So you'll never take up a cross because that's an instrument of suffering and shame. It leads to death. But that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I. Deny myself, take up my cross, and then follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's the pattern. So did you read Luke chapters 1 through 3? I think is what it was. Okay, so this week you should be reading Luke chapters 4 through 8. And I already told you, it's not on this calendar, it'll be on the next one when you start October, because we're not there yet, that I even got you so you'd look at the calendar and say, is there a potluck this week? Is there a movie this week? There's a movie on there. Is there a Bible study this week, or is it quilting? You'll have to look at those scriptures and say, they're right there in your face. Did I read these? Do I have sincere faith, one that leads to actions, one that shows that I am changed, one that shows that I'm like Christ, and do I have a good conscience? Am I training to be godly? That's what Paul goes on to write Timothy, and he writes it to the church too. Timothy is a pastoral letter. We try to take out the things that apply to pastors, but we're all preachers of the gospel. We're a royal priesthood together. We're all called to proclaim, to be a witness, to testify, to train up others to do the same, even to martyrdom. Martyrdom. I said it, mart. Thank you, whatever. We got it. There's a D in there, and I'm getting a T. <laughs> even if it means death. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of salvation. We proclaim that loud and clear yesterday. Mary Ann's life proclaimed that. Each and every one of you proclaim that. It's up to them to decide if they believe it or not. But we continue to train, we continue to teach, we continue to shine. And we pray. We pray intercessory prayers for others, for our children, for our family, for our friends, that they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ that leads them to salvation. And if we live a hypocritical life, they're not going to see a genuine faith. We're not going to have a clear conscience. <clears throat> the end goal, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, he said the goal, or the King James Version says, the end of this command or commandment, a command, not just a suggestion, is to love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, the word means without hypocrisy, Without putting on a mask and playing out a role and acting like I'm a Christian and I go to church, it's sincere. There is no mask. If you want to call me a Jesus freak, I'm going to say, thank you. I am. And let me tell you why. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I cannot help but sing a song of joy because of my salvation. That's why I wanted to stress that in Luke. As you read on in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 8, Verses 18 and 19, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you a command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good, fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and have suffered, suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. 
Then in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read, In the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in too much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. That's last week's message. Sincere faith and a clear conscience. That I have lived my life the way I'm supposed to live. That I can know for sure that I will inherit eternal life. That I'm not playing a game. I'm not acting out a role on the stage. My faith is sincere. I can't help but live this way. I can't help but be concerned about others. I can't help but serve. It comes natural because God lives in and through me. <clears throat> and then in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter time some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. We fight a spiritual battle. You are serving one master or the other. You're being influenced by the Holy Spirit or you're being influenced by demonic spirits. You are. That's what Scripture says over and over again. So when you take and say, I don't have time to do this, whether it's reading your Bible, whether it's reaching out to love to someone, are you in step with the Holy Spirit or are you listening to another spirit? That's for you to decide. But the Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith even and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such th teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. No clear conscience. It's been seared, burnt. As you keep reading on in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, have nothing to do with godless myths godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promises for both the present life and the life to come. Don't quarrel over these trivial things inside the church that you're arguing about. <laughs> Instead, love, serve, don't keep records of wrongs. Think of others over yourself. Thank God. Praise God with everything that you have. And love others. This is the fulfillment of the law, the greatest commandments that Jesus said. Is that how you're living your life? Does it come second nature to you because your faith is sincere? And do you have a clear conscience because that's the way that you live? And there's no way that you know that you're not saved because it just comes naturally. A tree naturally grows up and reproduces. Whatever God's creation is, it naturally does what it's called to do. You and I have a choice. Will we live for Jesus or will we continue to live for ourselves? Are we saved or are we playing a game? Because Scripture is, again, it's clear. It says few find that narrow path. And it says many on that day will say, Lord, Lord. That's not the unrighteous. That's the ones who think they're righteous who are surprised on that last day. Not just surprised. Bewildered among anything you could ever imagine because they thought they were going to spend eternity with God. And Jesus says, depart from me. I don't know you. Have nothing to do with godless myths so that you don't lose track. Rather, train yourselves to godliness. How much time do you put forth on your spiritual health? These pants are new. You can't say that these pants are not worn out because they're brand new. <laughs> but you can tell my shoes aren't used a lot, even if they're, they're used inside. So, so a workout for me is, you know, 15 to 30 minutes on that elliptical. Is that a lot? More than some. Not as much as others. I train for my physical health based on the passion that I have to do it because of the goal that it gets. And Paul says that training to God, physical training is good. It's good for the body. It'll help you live better, stronger, everything else. But training to godliness, spiritual training to godliness, has benefits in this world and forever and ever, and ever. So I'll ask again, how much time are you putting forth training your spiritual health? 
Paul tells Timothy this so that he won't fall behind. <clears throat> and Timothy's supposed to tell this to the church so that they'll live it. So that they can face anything that comes in life. So they can be a light. They can shine brightly. So that they can have eternal rewards. They're not building up kingdoms based on castles built on sand. But they're, basing, they're building eternal kingdoms that will not be destroyed. What about serious training? Okay, I told you I'd do a little bit here and there. I'm not doing any right now. I better get back onto it today, honey. But what about an athlete's training? Don't you know that we run a race? Don't you know that your body's a temple? Don't you know that you're supposed to present your bodies as a living sacrifice? Don't you know you're supposed to train up your children in the way of the Lord and they won't depart from it? This is a race that we've entered in. It's not a competition among ourselves. It's a group thing that we're doing together to make it to the finish line. And we're supposed to run with perseverance and throw away anything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So if I've signed up to compete as an athlete, now re-examine yourself and ask me how much your spiritual training you're doing. Do we fall short? Do you ever check your physical health? You should, especially as you get older. You know, it's been a while since I've had a colonoscopy. I, did I say that out loud? <laughs> That's something nobody wants to go through. But we do it because we want to find out this, and then you look at what happens, and you do the, what you need to do to change it, right? Well, here's a simple test. BMI, do you know what that means? Body mass index. <clears throat> It'll tell you how overweight I am or not. It won't necessarily tell me how fit, because there's a lot of other things to put in there. Blood pressure, cholesterol level, you know, your stamina, all kind of things. But just a simple test. It's called a body mass index. It'll tell me a starting point. <clears throat> Male, 56. Height, 71 inches. This is me. I shrunk 72 inches. I could fudge a little bit. Say I 72 inches, and I get a little better result. But that would be deceiving me, wouldn't it? 182 pounds on a good day. <laughs> good day. Waist, 34 inches. There's no activity level mentioned here. Anything else that I have to put in this test? And I get my results. Overweight. Just a little. <laughs> but overweight. So what do I need to do about it? It's up to me. It's not up to you. No one else makes me do whatever. It's up to me to say, I'll do something about it or I won't. I'm going to ask you again, how is your spiritual health? I can't change your spiritual health. Only you can. And it's based on the sincere faith that you have. And then look at your conscience when you're evaluating yourself. Mine was 25.4. It should be 18.5 to 24.9. Okay, 25.4, that's not bad. If I make it to 24.9, I'm in that range, but I'm still not down towards the 18 that uh, needs to be fit for an athlete. I signed up to run this race for Jesus Christ, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Why would I not train up to be godly? Yes, it's the Holy Spirit that transforms you, that changes you, but I have to put my part in. I eat every day. If I eat better, it's better for me. The food doesn't come into me through osmosis. I don't look at it like that on the table. How many times do I look at my Bible and not pick it up and read it? Because I don't have time. Number one excuse. Really? That's what you're going to tell Jesus on that day? I did not have enough time? Number one excuse for not being godly. I don't have time to go do this visit. I don't have time for whatever else. Number two is, it's not my calling. I'm not, I'm not equipped for it. <laughs> Give that excuse too, come the day of glory. You have been completely filled with the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus was, and he went into the, the wilderness to be tempted, to go without food for 40 days. <clears throat> Psalm 
So here's what the results of my BMI said for me to do. <laughs> well, first it told me, he said, if I wanted to live healthier and longer, that I need to embrace healthy living or healthy, healthy eating, increase my activity level, set goals and assess those goals and adjust. Okay? But will I do anything? Here's the kicker. I'm barely overweight now. Remember that. Barely overweight. 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. That's a lot for being moderately overweight. Okay, if I'm moderately spiritually overweight, and I'm reading my Bible some now because I'm still eating and I'm intaking and I'm doing some things. I'm walking, so I'm, I'm exercising my faith. I'm giving. I need to give 150 minutes more to prayer, to reading God's Word, to giving to others, to serving in my church and my community, just to get myself into that range where I might could say I'm healthy. These aren't exact numbers. Don't take me. I'm using this as an illustration. And if I'm training to be an athlete, I want to do that much more. Now, it didn't say I could cut that time back from 150 minutes. I could do 75 minutes of vigorous activity. I don't think I could do five minutes of vigorous activity. Come on. So I had to go with 150 of moderate if I do anything. But will I do anything? I'm trying to make this point on a spiritual realm. Will I do anything about my spiritual health? Do I want to live longer and healthier? If I do, I do something about my physical do I want to have results that are profitable in this world and in the world to come? This world. Remember the tack I put up on the wall? You can still see the hole right there if you can see it. <laughs> Compared to the whole wall, that's this life. That's eternity, and that's not a fair comparison. And Paul says, training to godliness will benefit me now and forever. have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Not the sins that you did before, but just what's changing you in church to keep you from being focused on being the church, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Rather, train yourselves to be godly. So if I enter in a workout program and I get in a program with Barry, point you out, Barry, sorry, then we're more likely to do it together. We're more likely to stay with it. We're more likely to train to get healthier because I've got someone coming along the side of me. Does that remind you back to everything written in Hebrews? And if I stumble and fall, here he is to pick me up or hold me accountable or whatever it is and vice versa. Isn't that why we're part of the family of God? For physical training is of some value. It is. And remember, this is a time of Olympic Games, and that's big in society. They knew what these athletes did, what they stood for. You know what they stood for? They stood for themselves winning, but they didn't go to, out to race for themselves to win. They won a crown for the emperor, the king, for his country. Hail, Caesar! Sorry if I scared you. Hail, King Jesus! Look at what Paul's trying to tell them. <clears throat> Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Godliness is used twice, or be godly, in verses 7 to 8. It's used 15 times in the New Testament. Nine of them are in First and Second Timothy. To be godly. Godliness to be like God in this world. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the Holy Spirit is the one that will transform you into perfectness, completion, so that you're ready for the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> first Timothy 2, verse 1, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. This praying and thanking and interceding for people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness. That's the first time he uses it in 1 Timothy. And holiness, this sanctified, set apart. 
This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to save and come to the knowledge of the truth. I said it yesterday, I'll say it again today. Mary Ann got that. At some point, a light bulb went off. She got that aha moment, whatever it was, and she lived her life for that reason, so that other people would come to know Jesus Christ. You might have been a bad person before, you might have been a great person before, but when you get it, you will do it with a motivation that you want others to know the hope that you have. And you can't keep that quiet. 1 Timothy 3.16, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. And it talks about Jesus. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up into glory. This song that Paul is singing here, because he can't be quiet. This song of joy, which is Jesus Christ. And then we have 1 Timothy 4, 7, 8, having nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, rather train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promises for both the present life and the life to come. Four times so far in Timothy. <clears throat> Paul goes on to write, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourselves wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Look at this way that you're training. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Look at that promise. The ones that are hearing the words of your life by what you're doing. 1 Timothy 5, verse 24, The sins of some are obvious, Reaching the, <clears throat> the place of judgment ahead of them, the sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds, godliness, translated here in the NIV as good deeds, because that's how people see. They let, you let your light shine before others that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is heaven. The good deeds of some are obvious, <clears throat> and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. 1 Timothy 6, All who under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have, be have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree... Uh, these are the things that you are to teach and insist on, excuse me. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord, Je Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words. Now, it's a shame that 1 Timothy today is a book that is quarreled over with words. Should a deacon be a man or a woman? Can a woman speak in church? What about slaves? Does, is, God, is God for slavery since he says this? You are a slave to one master or another. Why do you think Paul's writing this here? Be happy. Be content. Know that you're free in Christ. Free not necessarily to change the physical bondage that you're in, but to forever change the spiritual bondage. And you serve one master or another. Whether you're a slave or a woman, or any other physical, human being. Whatever your lot is in life, God may release you from it physically, and He may not. But you're free in Christ to serve Him no matter what you're in. Look at Nick Vujicic, or if I said that wrong, he was born without limbs, and he serves God. Look at Joni Erickson Tata, and she'll tell you if she never had that accident, she would not have lived the life that she's lived for God. Whatever the things are, doesn't matter. What matters is how you serve God in the capacity that He has you in. <clears throat> Don't quarrel over things in the church. They result in, verse 4, envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspension, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind. That's inside the church. That's the problem going on in the church. Instead of living godly lives. Now this is the church of Ephesus. Remember in Revelation, because you're going to start reading that before too long, that Jesus says, you've fallen out of your first love. You don't do the things that you used to. 
He used to show me all these things that showed how your love was. God doesn't need them. But if we're not showing them, are we truly in love? If you don't believe me, guys, go do something special for your wife today and look how surprised she looks. Because we don't do the things that we first did. Shame on us. <clears throat> Verse 5, And constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to, fi to, to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain in the present and in the future. Verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content <clears throat> with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and, it, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin or destruction. One outcome or the other. And whether you live your life training to godliness or you're un, unhealthy and you may enter the kingdom of heaven, you may not, but you don't have the benefits that that training to godliness had for all eternity. Because if you didn't train, you're not going to get the benefits of it. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have even wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They've seared their conscience. But you, man of God, free, flee from all this and pursue or run after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith so that you may have a clear conscience and so that you fought well and you have benefits promises for all eternity. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. So what about my spiritual health? Putting it back to me, not you. How is it? Because I'm the one that has to answer to this sermon. You do too, but I have to too. What will I do to train up to godliness? Will I continue on just like I am? Will I do more? Will I just let it go in one ear and out the other? What will I do? What will you do? Godliness, simply put, this is my definition, is being like Jesus, who is God, and the Holy Spirit, who is God, living through me. If heaven is a place that is perfect, where every tear is dried, where there is no death, everything else, and that's your hope, and you should be training to that now and letting the Holy Spirit transform you through and through. The word training is, well, there's a verb and a noun, and it's used both in these verses because there is to train yourself to godliness, and then, then training is healthy. So you've got the verb. You're supposed to train vigorously as a Greek, Greek athlete which is honoring his country. He's competing not only for himself, if, if that's even a, a motive, he's competing for the king, for Caesar, and for his country to bring glory and honor to it. And gymnasia is the noun, the physical training that is good. Does that, that word sound familiar? It's where we get our word gym from. But you know how the athletes trained? <laughs> Walt does. They were serious about it. They didn't let anything hinder them. What's the word mean, Walt? That's right, naked. <laughs> I got shorts on. I'm not that serious yet. I've never preached in shorts. <laughs> so that's his first. I told you to remember my sermon illustration. Naked. They let nothing hinder them, not even clothes. Wow. I got these pants in this week. Sherry said, Why you got stripper pants? Is there something I need to know? I was like, No. It's for a sermon illustration. I'll probably never wear them again. These are not stripper pants, <laughs> these are warm up pants that you can take and vent and then take off when you're ready to play the game. But I'm not playing it naked. I'll embarrass myself. I'll be a Jesus freak. I'll be whatever. I will shepherd you as, as Jesus shepherds me. Please hold me accountable. That's what we're here for. So that when the time comes, we can serve. And we can see a miracle that we, we fed a lot more people than we ever anticipated feeding. 
Everything else, it just works because you serve the Lord and you see the miracles He does and other people see it and they see that you love. What a statement, what a testimony, what a witness for Jesus Christ by your loving deeds. Don't quarrel over other things. Don't bicker and buy. Don't keep records of wrong. Love as Jesus Christ loved you. And no greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for his friends. It was even a miracle I got the pants off because I tried it one time before <laughs> and I got like half off. <laughs> so that's a miracle. Here's the point. And I don't want you to miss it. Greek athletes were dedicated to winning the race. Are you? What else matters? When it's all said and done, what else matters rather than hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant? I didn't give much of a sermon yesterday. The, the, the songs... The lyrics from the songs and the Bible verses that the family gave me was a great sermon. I mean, totally, totally. All I said when I got a chance to say my part was, Marianne was a light to me. She kept me going when I had doubts. I saw that hope in her. She inspired me. And I know without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt that I will see her in heaven and I won't just hear well done from Jesus I'll hear well done from her and I'll say same back at you girl because she got it what will you do when you examine your spiritual health it's up to you there's not one of us in here that couldn't train harder to win the, 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 the battle's already won But we're still here in the flesh fighting the fight with the power of the Holy Spirit to show everyone that that battle is won in Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty God. Your ways are so mysterious and so greater than ours. We don't understand everything. But Lord, we do understand that we walk by faith, not by sight. And that even the world knows that you exist from the beauty of all creation. But Lord, you have given us a new mindset. You've wrote, written your laws on our heart. And you've got the Holy Spirit training us up to be godly as long as we'll submit. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for your mighty, wonderful ways, your amazing grace, the love that you pour out on your children. May all of creation sing their praises to you, Lord, before, for the fact that we cannot stay silent. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you for the love of Jesus Christ that you put in our hearts. Let us put it to action as the body that serves you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.